going about it. So now if you think about it, like what is now, what is now second generation CRISPR? Second generation CRISPR is more the ability to, it's more the ability to cut DNA, bring in a template of your choice. So like a healthy DNA strand and you paste that healthy DNA strand in the spot, in the cut spot where the, the mutation was and you're bringing in your new template and you're inserting that into the genome. And in theory that this second generation approach is supposed to be uh, cleaner, uh, a cleaner edit and also a cleaner repair mechanism. So first generation leverages something called NHEA and second generation CRISPR leverages something called HDR and HDR is the body's natural process of repairing DNA. So we theorize that if we can leverage that, then it's probably cleaner, it's probably more effective. Sorry, I uh, just want to ask this question so our audience understands. What are some of the companies that maybe investors would have heard of uh, that are considered a second generation Casper, a uh, Casper, <laughs> CRISPR company? <laughs> right, so we have a few. So we have Graphite, um, the ticker is GRPH. We have Beam Therapeutics. Um, I, I could go all day long about these stocks, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to name the companies. Beam Therapeutics is another one. Ticker is B-E-A-M. We have Caribou Bioscience. The ticker is C-R-B-U. Um, on the top of my head, Verve is another one um, where they're targeting cardiovascular diseases. Their ticker is V-E-R-V. -E and that's just a few that, you know, anyone watching the video can dive into a little bit and, you know, start to learn about you know, how they make their edits. Would our third generation companies be something like prime editing absolutely so third generation i would i would think of more as like prime editing i would think of companies sort of like Zara therapeutics which is considered gene writing it's not really gene editing it's gene writing it's writing your own um it's very complex you're you're writing your own dna template into the genome in areas where it's safer to do so there's areas of the genome where it's safe to input that written DNA code, so to speak. Prime editing leverages sort of like a copy and paste mechanism, um, but early literature shows that it's much safer, easier to use. It's just as cheap as CRISPR-Cas9, um, but that's we're in the very early stages. Third generation CRISPR is still, you'd have to read literature to read about it. There's not much on their website. It's sort of they're keeping it close to the chest, but it's definitely something to watch out for. I believe like likely get there in the next five to 10 years. And prime editing, I believe is private still, right? They, the company prime uh, has not gone public. Private. Yep, yep. Right, and they have sort of like a uh, very close relationship with uh, the founder of Beam Therapeutics, David Liu. And so, Prime Medicine, the technology Prime Editing was a spinoff out of David Liu's lab. It's called Liu Lab. It, 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 it spun out of his lab from his, uh, the last name of the scientist is called Anzalone. Anzalone or Anzalone? A-N-Z-A-L-O-N-E. And you can search his literature. Um, and so what Prime Editing is, is that you, you introduce that DNA template that I was explaining before. A reverse transcriptase sort of like reads it and then pastes it into the, into the genome. Um, kind of like a copy and paste basically. tool out of Microsoft. Copy and paste tool. It's like, right. It's like a control okay. F into a Word document and then like typing what you want, you know, to go into there. Wow. It's Are sort of saying? like graphite. It's, it's graphite is the most similar to what we have to, pr to prime editing right now, but it's not prime editing. There's no reverse transcript taste. We have come so far in such a short amount of years looking back uh, from 2013 when all this started. So that's very encouraging with what diseases we could cure in the future. Well, uh, I, I just think about good... that. It's been like eight years down, right? And we have like almost, I don't know, seven, eight, nine gene editing companies. Well, CRISPR gene editing companies. I'm not talking about like zinc finger talent, but new generation. The, the cost has decreased down. I, I know it was astronomical to do gene sequencing back then. Um, and it's so much more affordable. It, it, was, it went from millions of dollars. I don't know the exact year, but it went from millions of dollars to now it's right around about a hundred dollars to, to, to sequence a genome. It was about a thousand dollars, I would say five, 10 years ago, something like that. 
So yeah, and we always see that be going down more, right? For sure. So for sure, uh, I think a hundred dollars is the sweet spot for a gene for a genome to be sequenced. I think it's as low as you probably will get it. Um, as far as like finding ch cheaper cast nucleases, probably it could happen. I'm sure there's a ton of naturally occurring naturally occurring cast enzymes in nature that we haven't discovered yet. So we mentioned a couple different companies, and I know that they're very popular on the FinTwit uh, universe. Uh, for those who don't know what FinTwit is, it's a financial Twitter, um, but also- It's a cult. Yeah, it's a cult. Yeah, we're a part of it, <laughs> so you can follow us there. <laughs> sure uh, are. So what leaders do you follow the most in, in companies? And I guess the second part of that question is, how do you determine who gets your hard earned money to invest in? Because it seems like there's so many different technologies that are out there. Uh, how do you choose, you know, at this point, nothing's really to product fully out there yet uh, for a lot of what these companies are doing. So how do you choose? So to answer the first part of your question, like who, what do I look for in a company? So typically there are some scientists that I love to follow. Like I'm always, they're always cranking out new research and like things that I, everybody who's interested in genomics should always be keeping on top of. And that's guys like David Liu, Jennifer Doudna, Charpentier, just people that you should always keep tabs on and people you want to, you know, you should be interested in because they're not just targeting like human therapeutics. They're also involved in, I should have, I should have mentioned Feng Zhang, that guy's a legend. They're, they're not just involved in human therapeutics. They're involved in diagnostics agricultural technology um you know there's always something there's always something um to look forward to with these companies so definitely always keeping tabs on those specific names that i just mentioned um literature is really important so the second part of your question what do i typically do like if i hear a name or something that i'm interested in i always go to the website that's the number one thing that i do so i go to the website the number one thing i do after that is i go to the technology tab and i click on our technology. So most companies will have an our technology tab. I make sure to read the our technology page. Like I, I read it through, I make, I try to understand it as much as I can. And uh, typically after that, I'll go to the pipeline and I'll go through the pipeline and I'll read, I'll, I'll try to check like, okay, is this target something? How, what does this addressable market look like? Is there a need for it? Um, could they possibly have a moat? Are there competitors? So that's stuff that I really, it, it, whether I know it off the top of my head or not, that's the stuff that I research. So typically this takes like, I've done it so much that this typically takes about five minutes. So I call this my five minute rule. So if I can't, if you can't compel me within these five minutes off of your website, I probably won't invest in you. If I am interested, I'll either invest or I'll put you on a watch list and I'll, I'll constantly monitor that company. So for example, Glue was a company that was always on my watch list and I finally pulled the trigger. Um, I was always interested in the science. I was interested in the technology. I just didn't know if I was ready to pursue like protein, degra uh, protein degraders, but I finally pulled the trigger because they passed my five minute rule. I saw that they probably have a huge uh, TAM, TAM we call it, tar target addressable market. Um, not many competitors, very novel space. It's very important for this to be a novel space. And also just like a sexiness factor, like, is this something retail wants to buy? Because like you, we can go all day long about stocks that probably should be valued way more, way more than what they are, but they're just not. And sometimes it's just as simple as not, not being sexy, you know, like maybe there's something else that's newer. And a lot of these technologies, you have to make sure like they don't get leapfrogged within the next five to 10 years. Like if you're investing, you want to make sure that your technology is novel, make sure that it's new and make sure that it's effective. So let's stop there and just so everyone understands the process that you have is what every pounding the table uh, team member has and, and what any real investor should have in doing your own due diligence, right? And making sure you're able to articulate and understand the company and technology easily, because if they're not able to articulate that to you, then why would you invest? Um, right. You're also looking for what problems are they solving and are they big enough to have right. an expansive amount of return for you as an investor. Uh, right. And then also uh, for those who don't know moat for basic, you know, new investors, uh, that's that competitive advantage, just like when they're 
king in the castle trying to stop the army. They had a moat around the castle that, that would prevent them from breaking in. Um, what is that moat for the company that's going to provide uh, a safe haven for them against competition? So, and Dom, I'd just like to add that like a moat doesn't necessarily have to be a huge addressable market. It could actually be the total opposite. It could be something super niche and super small where there's no, we call it an unmet need in biotech. So if there's an unmet need, and even if it's a very rare condition, if there's an unmet need, all those patients are going to flock to that one specific company. So if you can target that, so sickle cell is a huge addressable market where all of these, com almost all of these companies are trying to target it. But then there's these very rare genetic disorders that you can, you can pursue. Um, and I, I believe that they're, they're I don't know why I'm not remembering the name. There, there's, it's a certain class of drugs called orphan drug classification, I believe it's called, or something like that. I don't know why I'm forgetting. Um, but that just means that the FDA fast tracks it because there's such a high unmet need and there's such a, there's um, so much demand for that particular therapeutic. Yeah, that makes complete orphan sense. Orphan drug designation, I'm sorry. That's what it's uh, called. Orphan drug designation. So yep. with that... Uh, it sounds, uh, it brings just to mind a company that I'm invested in, in Novacure, who does uh, tumor treating electrical fields for late stage cancer uh, patients and in stage four and some of the most difficult cancers to treat. And so even though they're not able to cure the cancer, they're able to give extra years of life for those patients because they're able to stop the tumors from growing, to shrink them and to provide a better quality of life long-term. So there's no one else who has the patents. They have thousands of patents. Uh, they're not taking away from those other companies that are trying to cure cancer, but they're able to augment it. And so they have that niche that you're talking about. Dom, before we actually met, I actually listened to you speak about that company and I absolutely loved it. Very it's cool still stuff. A buy. It's because... actually, uh, uh, or I guess uh, we don't give financial advice here. So let me let me retract that statement. We'll probably cut that out. Uh, <laughs> it, it, uh, but you sh you should definitely give like a, br a broad overview of what what they do because I think they're super cool. It seems pretty novel to me. Yeah, and and another thing I think what we've talked about so far and all the companies we've discussed is founder-led CEOs. And I think there's just something special right. about having a founder-led CEO uh, who sticks through the, the good and the bad times and truly sees like their company. baby. Yeah, it, it's their child and they have a bigger vision. When they started it, they knew what the ultimate grand scheme was and where the, the finish line was. Um, and we don't always get to right. see that as investors. So, you know, sometimes we're just not patient enough to see it all the way through. Um, so on to the next question, uh, you know, when you look at uh, genomics and we're, we're talking about data, right? We're talking about having to understand our, the makeup of our body. Are there any companies that jump out at you um, that are kind of more of a picks and shovel type of play with genomics and not trying to necessarily cure any diseases? but provide the technology to enable these companies to achieve their goals and are still good investment. Right. So that's one of the reasons that I have twist biosciences in my, in my uh, portfolio, because at the end of the day, um, well, they're still in the process of scaling up when well, they're building a factory now. Um, I think they call it like factory of the future. It has some sick name. And um, what they're doing is building that factory so that they have the ability to scale up because there's going to be so much pent up demand for this product. So like, what is their product? Their product is that they can, they're basically the DNA plug in the most basic sense. They're the DNA plug, like the supplier for all of these companies. So you're, you're all, all, all of these genomic companies that you can think of that need to do like gene editing, for example, or, you know, or leverage DNA, they're, they're purchasing their DNA from Twist Biosciences. But Twist Biosciences also has like other platforms. So like data storage is another, you know, really big uh, play on the future. So we don't really necessarily know what it could be. But we do know is that what we do know is that DNA has this crazy capability of, of um, storing tons and tons and tons of information within a, a super tight confined space. So I think they even made like an analogy is that they could put the entire internet into the size of a shoebox if they just stored it in the form of DNA. 
So it's just something really cool, something to look forward to. Say that to. again yeah, for our listeners. You, <laughs> <laughs> have you heard about that? That's it's some really cool stuff. Um, so I have they actually have a partnership with, with Microsoft. That's how I heard about them was the partnership with Microsoft. Um, it, it was probably a year or two ago and they said, you know, this may not be something you're going to see a product from anytime soon, but the fact that they're marching to the right. beat of the drum to, to provide this and that data is constantly growing exponentially. How right. do you get your hands around that? Imagine data, data storage. In DNA. Yeah. Right. Um, so I just want to cover really quickly. So there's hot storage and cold storage. So cold storage, you probably know this, Tom. Cold storage is data that you don't really need. You, can, you save it and you use it for some point in time later in the future that maybe you want to access it. That's typically what they want to do. That's what they say they want to do with DNA storage right now. I think the real money, if they can somehow get this technology up to speed, is hot data storage. So like DNA, DNA data that you can access at any time, sort of like from the cloud. But it just seems like it's too difficult to do that right now. But just something cool to monitor. I mean, and um, I also, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, even on cold storage, um, because this is the world that I live in with working at VMware with, with working with virtual right. storage and, and customers, there's different types of archival data, right? For law firms and healthcare. Okay. And, um, if you were able to provide such a data amount that you could store for a affordable cost that would save company companies millions of dollars, they would do that. Um, so it, it's interesting where they're headed with that. I could see the cold storage at least being the first first piece that they go with to, to being able to make it usable as a product. Right. And I think like another thing to consider is, you know, how long do these storage facilities last? So like a computer versus DNA, if you think about it, like DNA has lasted, you know, if you freeze it, you can, it, it can last forever. I don't know if you can necessarily say that about like computers. Um, it's just something no, to you take into consideration. <laughs> I remember I read that somewhere. 